Hey up guys, welcome back to the workshop. Today I'm going to be building a timber fireplace surround. Um, I'm currently panelling a office and uh, the customer's got a, a big sort of old cast iron safe. Um, so instead of having a fireplace in the office, we're going to mount the safe in where the fireplace used to be and uh, I'm going to make myself or make him a, uh, a fireplace surround to go around the safe and uh, match in with the panelling. I'm going to break the build down into to three segments really, um, or three or four segments. So I'm going to build the legs as a, a panelled frame, so two legs as, as single panelled frames. And I'm going to build the, the centre part between them as a panel frame, so you could look at that as one part of the build in that it's all sort of shaker style panels. Um, I'm not going to focus too much on uh, building them because you can watch the shaker door video and just set them out to the, to the size of the fireplace, so it doesn't need too much detail on that with this video. I'm going to make some sort of corbels, I think they're called, for the support of the mantelpiece. So I'll uh, try and focus on that a little bit as I, as I do them. And uh, the other part is the uh, top. So uh, I've drawn it out with a oak top to, um, to match the desk and uh, a few other bits that are in the room. But uh, I'm currently undecided as to whether to paint that top or to leave it as a solid timber. So um, I'm gonna make my mind up as I go through the build and, uh, and see what it looks like. So let's uh, jump straight in and uh, get some timber out and start making these panels. So I'm going to be using a coir for this project. Um, it's a little bit more expensive than your, your average timber that you'd use on a internal sort of joinery build. But uh, for me, it's you get the benefit sort of after you've installed it in the fact you you don't see any cracking in the joints, um, it's very stable, there's no swelling or shrinking um, in place once it's been fitted. Uh, it's, it's dead frustrating when you go back to a project and uh, in six months time or, or two years time down the line you, you return and visit and uh, there's cracks on all the joints and the door gaps have, have opened up from say one and a half to two mil to three, four, five mil gaps because the timbers acclimatised to a room that it wasn't acclimatised to before and uh, and it's it's just sort of ruined everything so um, I like using the coir because uh, it sort of negates that uh, that evil in that uh, it doesn't move. Okay, so I've planed up these pieces of timber for the sides of the, uh, the mantelpiece upright. I was originally going to use a uh, face frame and then make a separate fillet to go back to the wall. But uh, I've actually had some timber that was thick enough to do these corner posts in one solid piece. So I've got them out in solid pieces and the infill parts are actually slightly thinner. Um, bits that I've, I've got left over from other work, so um, I'll join them in between with the domino and because you don't see the back it's not going to make any difference. Um, so I'm just going to set these out, I'm going to choose a face and an edge, it's important to mark a face edge, um, face mark and an edge mark on stuff like this, if, especially if you're doing sort of different thickness materials it can get uh, confusing quite quickly. So um, I'm going to choose my best faces and then uh, set out this uh, panel gap here um, for where I'm going to put my dominoes. Okay, so that's all the dominoing done for the uprights. 
I've got some temporary dominoes here, so if you just sand a couple of uh, dominoes down, I'll just mark them with a bit of uh, coloured pen. They push in and you can remove them a lot easier um, than if you just grab one out of the packet and try and remove it uh, then, because they seem to compress into place and uh, they are a git to get out. It's a handy tip. So I'll just, uh, just assemble it quickly, show you where we're at. Okay, so that's our current stage. So um, what I'm gonna need to do is put a panel in the uh, center of the post. So I'm just gonna set the, uh, the groover up to the thickness of um, a panel, which is nine mil uh, birch ply, and uh, set it from the face, and then machine all these components from that face, um, the setback that I want. So I've used a 12 mil setback on all the paneling on this job, so I'll keep it the same on the uh, fireplace as well. These parts at the top and bottom aren't gonna need anything to, uh, to fill them in because at the top we've got the corbel, which is just wide enough to uh, cover the gap so you won't see it. And at the bottom, I'm gonna uh, skirt round in, uh, into the return to the, uh, to the sheet that's underneath the safe. What I will say when you're, you're dealing with anything that you're dominoing, like a shaker style, is be really careful not to uh, to knock and damage the corners because uh, that's your, your joint line. Okay, so it's uh, it's exactly the same principle with the top of the mantelpiece. So uh, just a small shaker frame, um, slightly different dimension pieces, but uh, this uh, this section of the frame, I don't know if you can see it anywhere there, look, is um, is actually narrower than the uprights, so it's a slightly less thickness. Um, so I've uh, one of the pieces that I've got out is is that thickness of the material by the sight line that you see, so it saves me again adding a piece onto the back, and uh, and then the top piece hasn't quite haven't quite got enough of that material to make the full width, but it doesn't matter because you don't see it. So um, this will just be set back and grooved the same 12 mil of the other piece, and uh, it will look like a square sort of flush face frame from the front. Um, like I say, exactly the same, just going to find my uh, nice clean edges, uh, set them out as my face and edge. I don't know if you can see on the camera, there's a nasty sort of split there, quite common with the uh, coir sometimes on the edges. So we're going to bury that um, in this piece here. So the bottom piece, um, top side at the back of the, uh, of the orientation of that piece of wood so that you'll never see it. So face there, because that's the face, and then the edge that we're going to use to groove is there. So face and edge mark, here and here. And then the top piece, so it's 35mm that we want in this direction. And uh, we'll choose the best face for that. Because I've already cut this to length, I'm sort of governed by which face I'm going to use. So I tend to choose a face before I cut them to length. The reason for that is, um, when you're cutting on the cross cut, you get a real sharp edge along the top of the cut where the saw teeth are uh, cutting into the wood. And on the underside, you tend to get a tiny bit of breakout. Now this can be uh, sort of negated with a zero clearance insert, but they don't tend to last very long. And uh, they're not really that necessary. If you, if you um, work the, the timber properly, then uh, you're not gonna see it. So. Um, yeah, I tend to, tend to keep my uh, faces and edges sorted before I cut them to length and then uh, that leads to a nice crisp um, sort of joint on the face. So this edge is quite nice, we'll joint him up, face and edge, face and edge. And then we've got uh, two little uh, stub sort of 50mm sections in between. So we'll mark a face and edge on there. And then they're going to sit 
uh, top and bottom on these pieces like this. So we're just going to mark that out for a joint as well. So I've cut these slightly long so when they've been glued up I can trim the ends nice and square. These pieces are also slightly thicker than they need to be so I want 50mm 50, 50 visual um, 50mm sight line of timber there and I've made these pieces 52 so I'll set out the internal panel to what I want to see there to allow the 50mm they will stick beyond by a couple of mil and then when I trim that off on the cross cut when it's glued together you get a, a really nice sharp sort of crisp edge to the uh, to the ends of this piece of uh, timber so that will join nicely into the other bits so we want a 700 mil panel gap. So uh, if we're looking at this piece of timber, it's uh, 811. So we want that uh, center to be, so if we come in 56 mil. And go off that uh, 56 mil. 700, so it's 800 when you're working off 100 mil. Should have uh, roughly 56 mil this side here. Yeah. We'll square them two uh, pieces over onto each other. I'll have to do that vertically because they're different thickness. can mark out my domino position. So I'm just going to come in 25mm and uh, mark the dominoes. Just as easy to mark each one because there's only four. And then uh, same with the uh, pieces of timber. In fact I don't need to mark them, I can just come in 25mm on, the, uh, on the machine itself. Okay, so I've put my uh, adjustable groover in the spindle moulder. I know how thick or how many spaces to put in this because I use the 9mm birch all the time. So um, put the appropriate spaces in to set the thickness of that. I'm going to set it to 12mm off the deck. There we go. And uh, about 8mm of depth, um, depth of cut. Now because I've got to machine some short pieces um, that I've cut off to length already before I've uh, grooved them, um, I'm going to have to use a, uh, a false fence. So the false fence will stop the uh, material falling into the spindle moulder uh, between the two fences so it bridges the gap on a part of the timber that's not being cut. So uh, I'm just going to set this one up here, so you lock the fences off, I'm going to clamp this board to it and then uh, push it back while the cutter's on to cut its own slot in the board. If I just bring the camera over the top, you want to make sure that these fences are further enough apart. It's not going to matter so much that they're close to the cutter when you've got a strong backboard, but they want to be far enough apart so when you plunge this back into the cutter the fence isn't going to get cut by it uh, as you do so. So uh, it's quite common to set them up fairly close like you would do normally and then when you plunge it back that extra depth of the thickness of this um, it's going to interfere with these. So uh, that's just one point to be noted. Also you want, uh, want to make sure your clamps are uh, as, as out of the way as possible. So um, if you are going to be using the, the power feed that the clamp's not going to be in the way of the power feed. So I'll turn the extraction on and then uh, push this back and then run all my pieces through.
for the smaller sections and then on the uh, workshop tour. Sorry about the noise in the background. You may have seen on the workshop tour the small material jig. So uh, this is uh, a good example of uh, when to use it. So face mark, the, the edge of the piece that I want. So face mark maps the uh, outside face and the edge is where the groove will be. You sit this, uh, you capture that. You sit this on the bed of the machine, the material on the bed tight as well. And uh, this lever here, just activates cam action spring clamp, like so, and you just move the, uh, the stock piece here up near to the uh, to the machine, to the piece. So uh, set that so that it will clamp onto it. Push down on both pieces and clamp it. That. Uh, holds the piece nice and securely. Now I've got machine this now with my uh, hands completely out of the way and because I've got the uh, sacrificial fence as well there's no chance of the small piece diving into the cut. Now uh, we'll just give them edges a quick sand tempting to uh, to not sand the edges and keep that really nice sharp planed edge but uh, I hate to see a planer ripple on a uh, piece of finished woodwork um, it just it either screams that you're an amateur or, um, or you've just not been bothered to finish it properly so to avoid rounding the corner off I'd always use a flat backing pad that's uh, a fair size and sand it flat like this doesn't take long to uh, take the ripples out and uh, it's just a much more professional job. All that's left to do then is measure for the panels. I've found the easiest way to do this is to add on what you want to add in the panel. So I've done 8mm grooves, I'm going to have a 2mm gap all the way around, well, two more gap in total because I know I can cut dead square and it's not going to uh, expand too much where it is. So eight mil grooves, I want two mil gaps, that's a 14 mil um, extra for the panel to what the grooves are. Um, and then I add that on to the tape at the start instead of adding it on afterwards. So we want 106 mil. Okay, so when I'm cutting small panels on the panel saw, um, you'll find that they, uh, if you've got a machine like this, um, you'll see as you get smaller in the panel sort of widths and sizes, they fall between the slats so as you plunge the saw in and the guard hits the material it tends to dip it into the uh, saw bed and you don't get a square cut. So I've just got a uh, sacrificial um, half a sheet of 18mm ply and uh, I use that as a backing board for anything that's sort of thinner material or smaller pieces. Um, and all I've got is a small piece of wood that uh, I've cut off to a set depth so that um, basically it stops the saw from plunging. It, it sort of hits the frame against the saw body as it plunges and it'll only plunge into that, uh, that sheet about 3 mil and uh, it just uh, stops you cutting through it so you can reuse it and um, it makes for a, an easy way of cutting smaller pieces. So they're cut to size, um, I'll just quickly give them a sand and pop some paint on them and then when I come back in the morning uh, they're ready, I can just denib them and I'll glue them into the frames. So I'm going to uh, glue these up now. 
added a extra piece in at the top um, where the corbel is going to sit to allow me to fix that corbel through the back of the uh, fireplace um, because then pieces weren't very wide it only meant it was sort of being attached or glued on by 10mm of uh, material so just added in a, a, another little rail for that uh, fixing point. Now because I've uh, I've made these slightly oversized, I'm going to plane these edges off um, to fit. So they're, they'll be about 203, 204 mil wide, and I want a 200 mil finish. I can use the surface planer to clean these edges up. If you're not going to be doing that and you're making it to complete size, um, if you're ever bashing the edge or anything like that, make sure you use a, a wooden block to uh, protect it from being like dents. And uh, if you catch the corner, you're going to knock the corner off. So. Um, you just want a, a protective piece like that, if you're ever hitting, hitting any wood, you can hit that, dent that and it spreads the load through onto the part that you're trying to, uh, trying to adjust. Same principle applies um, when you're clamping the edges as well, if you're, if you're finishing this, this edge here and uh, not removing any material, you want some bits of timber to protect the, uh, the timber from the actual clamp, um, from the pressure of the clamp, putting a dent in there. Okay, so I've got the uh, two blocks that I glued up earlier. I'm just going to plane these square. I'm going to uh, get them to about uh, I don't know, 125mm wide by 100 deep, so I originally planned to finish them 100 by 100 but uh, I'm just going to see what they look like a bit wider and uh, make them to that size and then um, cut them down if needs be a bit later on. So I'll plane it all up on all four sides and cut it uh, roughly to length. Um, just be careful if you're doing anything with, with big bits of wood that are quite short. If you're uh, running them over the planer and stuff, it can get uh, it can get quite dangerous quite quickly. So if your beds are quite far apart from the, and you've got quite a big cutter block, you'll find uh, smaller pieces quite often snatch. So uh, just be careful. Okay, let's try and uh, draw this shape out on here. Let's pick a spot, 50 mil. Glued these up and planed one, one edge off so it's nearer the, uh, the 
glue joints nearer the back so that uh, you shouldn't see it as much in the curve. 20 mil. Looks about right. Let's do it by eye, shall we? A bit of old school. Okay, so when you cut one out off the other, um, I usually mark the two together, it's just a couple, and then you know that that is the point at which they're gonna be the same. So you can then sand them together at that point and create a nice uh, smooth sort of equal mold in between the two. But a good way to check if your saw's out of square and have the same both sides is to just flip them two sides over and see if they match up again there. So. It's just a good check to make sure that you're, you're cutting nice and square. If you've got a load of these to do, you want it to be as accurate as possible, and then you can clamp them all together in a line and sand along the whole lot together. And it, it just stops you from rounding these edges and uh, makes life a lot easier. Okay, there you go, I've finished sanding now. So you can see when you take them apart how much clamping them together keeps the edges square. So they're nice and crisp on that centre where it's been uh, clamped together. And then on the outside edges there's a bit of dipping and variation. So because I've kept these a bit wider, I'm going to trim a tiny bit off the edge there to get rid of that uh, dipping from the sanding. Okay, so on the centre panel, I've marked out 50mm from this inside edge and squared the line over to there. I'm going to square that up on the saw and then set it to my width, which is 700, and then square this side up the same. Okay, so while I've uh, mock assembled the uh, the components, let's just put some marks on. I'm going to put a couple of dominoes in this top section to align it. Just a uh, five by thirty um, plunged into this, and then plunged into that. Then I'll screw it through this section here. A couple of screws in there, and glue that together. Um, 
And then this section, I'm gonna domino this piece from the back, 30 mil deep, and then this piece from the face. So I'm gonna to have to measure them. I'm gonna come in at around 30 mil from the edge. And then at uh, 162, 132, to 30, 132. Then I'll do the same on this back edge here. So 30, and then 132. Just write a little D on there so I know what the marks are for. So I'm gonna come 30 mil from that back. And I want it to be the same from the back of this one so that they're level which is 38, so I want to be 8mm on this one. So 8mm deep from the face there, and 30 deep from the back edge there. And then the same on the other side. Change my mind on the dominoes, I'm going to use a 8 by 40 So I'm going to set this up. So I want 8mm depth on there, so it's handy, it's on a 16mm stop. A single width, then we want uh, 25 deep because it's an 8 by an 8 by 50 domino. Okay, so this is the mantle top. I've not cut it to length yet because I want to just uh, test cut one end and see how it comes out uh, with grain rippage because it's uh, a coir. I'm just going to see how it uh, it holds on to the grain as I as I do that end cut. Um, I might have to look at uh, really giving my cutters a proper sharp and if it's uh, too rough. So uh, before I cut it to length and mould it, I'm just going to try it. This is the profile I'm going to use. I'm just going to tilt it slightly in the spindle and uh, leave 38mm on the top there. So if I draw around a limiter, you should be able to see the profile we're going for. So you'll see here, I'm just going to cut a test piece first, check the measurements, and I'm going to uh, just wind the cutter back, so I'll wind the fences forward or the cutter back um, and then cut the ends of the piece first so breaking through the majority of the cut on the end grains then I'm going to wind it back to my finished cut position complete the end grain cuts and then do the same on the uh, long grain along the front of the mantle piece um, reason for this is to uh, take the majority of the, the cut away um, away from the finished cut and then it leaves a nice clean cut just doing that tiny bit for the uh, for the remainder and uh, you do the ends first so that you avoid the breakout on the uh, back of the board um, you can use a support piece to uh, stop the breakout but uh, once you've cut that long grain cut um, it can't be avoided really um, if you've got to do any more depth of cut on the end grains if you've already done the long grain, you've, you're always going to be cutting into uh, nothing and get some blow out. Okay, so I've dry assembled uh, most of the fireplace. Um, I've since 
position the safe in the in where it's going to go, and uh, it sits about uh, 12 mil back from the face that this is sitting on. So I'm going to have to take 12 mil off these right-hand pillars and off the top if it needs it on this, which I don't think it does. But uh, 12 mil off the depth there, so that this pillar will sit back 12 mil into the opening. Okay, so the last bit um, after the uh, management piece top is there's a like, skirting board. I wouldn't call it a skirting board, it's more of like a plinth block. But uh, I'm just going to run a, a bead detail around the top and leave the rest of it nice and plain. And then the skirting board will come into it uh, and, and finish into it. So this is about 295 tall. Um, and the skirting board's about 220, so it'll give a nice, uh, nice sort of plinth block height to match the rest of the room. Um, sorry I've not filmed it particularly well, I'm in a bit of a rush. It's currently about 7am uh, and I'm trying to get this finished so I can try and fit it today. Change my mind, I'm going to go for a OG profile like I put on the mantelpiece. Okay, so the last component to go on, I've detailed a little uh, sort of half round ball nose moulding and I'm just going to pin that around these sections. Um, it's going to be mitred around there and back into the, uh, into the fireplace and then again back into the panelling. So I've, uh, I've got this, this small D profile moulding from, uh, from a coir I've uh, machined up and I'm going to uh, going to get this uh, cut on when it's in place, so when it's fitted I'm going to make sure that these run right back to the panelling and then right back into the fireplace because I'm not quite sure how much extra depth I'm going to need to the fireplace, whether I'm going to have to build these up slightly, so uh, if I can run them back in um, it will look a lot neater than if I do everything flush with this part and then have a gap or anything to the, uh, to the other components in there. So. I'm going to cut this on site and I'll do the exactly the same with the uh, sort of the plinth block that joins into the skirting board. I'm going to mitre that round on site as well.
Okay, so paint's dry. I'm just gonna give everything a light denib, chuck it in the van, and then uh, get it fitted. Okay, so I've got the basic frame fitted. There's not a lot of room to film in here, so I'm gonna to have to uh, hold this freehand, so apologize if it's a bit wobbly. I've screwed the frame back um, behind where the skirting's gonna go at the bottom, and then skewed some screws in on the top, and I've just sat the mantelpiece on the, on the top there. So I'm just gonna glue the mantelpiece down. I'm not gonna put uh, any fixings in it, and uh, hopefully then if we ever need to to remove it or do anything with it you can just break the bond on the glue and uh, remove the screws and the fireplace should peel off breaking the seal on the glue so um, I don't think we're going to get any movement with it being a coir so uh, I think that's more than strong enough to hold it so just sort of point out some of the detail on the uh, on the mantelpiece that I've sort of designed into it if it will focus um, so put the moulding on at the height to run in line with this uh, panelling here. So the mantelpiece is the same thickness as this strip, 70mm, but when we sort of mocked it up it looked it looked wrong if it sat sort of underneath it and equally it looked a bit dodgy if it sat perfectly in line with it. So we decided to offset it halfway through and uh, I've run the moulding exactly where it meets the panelling there and uh, standing back it, it just looks perfect, it was the right decision to do. And uh, the corbels run nicely in the centre with both the panel and the strip above, so that worked out nicely. And uh, the other detail that's matching with the room is when I've got the um, pieces mitered around the bottom which I'm going to do in a minute. They're exactly the same height as the uh, plinth blocks. I don't know if you can see over here. We've got quite a big, quite a tall plinth block either side of the um, architrave. So that runs in at the same height as that. So when the skirting runs round when I'm finished, it should, uh, should intercept it the same. So that should look good too. In terms of fitting, I've had to, uh, to glue um, a strip to the edge of the safe because none of it was square so um, it's both out of level in a front to back plane so it's twisted in itself and it's also slightly out of level across the top and down the side so I've picked a point where it's sort of slightly out in all directions and then I've um, I've made my fireplace 20 mil bigger to try and disguise the fact that it's slightly out um, and then I've, I've added that strip of timber in to get it all nice and level in a flat plane so when my fireplace went back it sat neatly against it and then I think we'll just, just paint that strip in um, in like a matte black paint when the decorator does that so hopefully you won't see it, that, it's, uh, that it's out of, of level and a bit twisted when it's all been painted in matte black but in general I'm, I'm really pleased with it you can see a really nice sort of grain effect showing through on the timbers um, it just just it's just a looks like a quality piece so uh, really really happy with it so far
I'm just going to mask the corners of the frame here. So I want to make this uh, removable because I don't want to fit it just yet, this piece of skirting. But I, uh, I want to get it glued up as a single piece. So just going to mask that internal corner. Just want to glue the joint. I can set it around that post to leave it to go off. Um, but then it's going to be removable because the masking tape should peel away. Okay, there we have it. We're, uh, we're pretty much there with the uh, fireplace surround. Um, I've took the masking tape off the uh, the bottom sort of uh, skirting board slash corner blocks there. Um, so the skirting will actually run into that. Oh, I've got a bit this to show you. So I've got quite a tall um, skirting that will run into these pieces here. Um, and that's how it will finish, just like the rest of the room, so running round. Um, I've put a uh, metal plate underneath the safe, um, painted matte black. I'm just going to, uh, I think the decorator will, will paint that in a bit and uh, age it to sort of match the safe. So uh, that should look pretty good when it's finished. Um, and I'm, I think I'm going to get some of these mouldings, just some small, small mouldings like this um, and pin them or glue them onto this steel plate at the bottom and uh, do a do a similar sort of shape as that, but uh, horizontally to just, just give that a bit of character. It looks a bit plain at the minute. But uh, for the purposes of this video and the uh, fireplace surround, I think we're pretty much there. It just needs uh, just needs decorating now. So um, thanks for watching. I uh, hope you've enjoyed this one. And uh, don't forget to subscribe, hit the like button, and leave a comment. Don't forget to head over to my Instagram page, at Bradshaw Joinery. I put loads of projects on there and stuff that I don't film and I'll also get some finished pictures of, uh, of this office and uh, the projects that I've worked on in here as well when it's all been painted and finished so uh, don't forget to check that out, it's at Bradshaw Joinery.